Praise the Lord, everybody. Yesterday we celebrated uh, our, our, we had our resurrection celebration service yesterday at the church, and uh, for good reason, because as you can tell, it is pouring the rain outside. And so, uh, big win for us on that one. But I, I wanted to just come to you just for a few minutes. I, I, I just could not see letting this day pass by uh, without, um, without sharing just a word. Um, because today we commemorate that uh, about 2,000 years ago that the Lord resurrected out of the grave uh, and that he uh, rose victorious over death, hell, and the grave and then he took the keys of death and hell. And uh, I, I was reading today, I was sitting out on my porch today and I was reading through all the accounts uh, whether it be Matthew or Luke or John and I was reading about the resurrection and, and then I began to read apologize about the camera movement, but I begin to read about Christ showing himself alive to his disciples. And we know that the first time he did it, uh, of course, he showed himself uh, to Mary Magdalene at the tomb, but the first time uh, that he showed himself alive, uh, he did so uh, to his disciples that were on the road to Emmaus. Uh, they, had, they had walked away from Jerusalem. Everyone else was still huddled in Jerusalem, but these two uh, had just left Jerusalem. It, 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 it indicates that maybe uh, they had decided, well, it's all over. The master is dead. Uh, maybe we were wrong about this whole situation. And they had left and went on a journey. And they were on the road to Emmaus. And I think it's incredible that Jesus didn't go to Jerusalem first. He actually went to those disciples who had walked away from the rest of the flock. Uh, which uh, is incredible because Jesus talked about the fact uh, that the shepherd will leave the 99 and will go after the one who is lost. And so the first thing he did was, as he went after those disciples who had left the rest of the gathering, left the rest of the flock, and he went after them to affirm, uh, to confirm that he was the Christ and to affirm their faith. And of course, uh, then uh, he gets to them, he questions them uh, as to what had happened, and of course they're sitting there, you know, more or less, have you you've been living under a rock this whole time? Uh, are you a stranger? Are you a foreigner that you don't know what's going on in Jerusalem? And they begin to tell, they begin to uh, rehearse to him what had happened uh, to their master, what had happened to their Lord, and how that he was crucified. Uh, and, and, and they were so disillusioned and disappointed. Uh, they were so disenfranchised. They, they, had, they had put all of their hopes uh, on this Jesus. And they said, we thought he would be the one to redeem us or to redeem Israel. And they didn't understand that he didn't come at that point to redeem them from the iron hand of Rome. He came to save them from themselves. He came to redeem them. And of course, we know this to be true uh, through the Old Testament prophets. And then G uh, when Jesus is heading down into the Jordan to be baptized of John, John declares the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the world. And, and it just struck me so powerfully that sometimes uh, an improper... Um, an improper understanding of who Christ is can really cause us to be disillusioned. An improper uh, understanding of what Christ's mission really is can cause us to be disgruntled and disenfranchised. And for many it can cause them to be offended and it can cause them to stumble and to walk away. Because the mission of Christ is not necessarily, was not to set them free from the iron hand and tyranny of Rome, the mission of Christ was to deliver them from themselves. And they didn't know it. They didn't see it. They didn't understand it. They didn't realize, even though the scripture had foretold it, even though uh, John had prophesied it, they didn't understand that he had come to deliver them from them. And now he sits down and eats with them. He breaks bread and their eyes are open and he realizes it is Christ. And then, of course, he goes on to Jerusalem. And the disciples are sitting there, they're in fear, they're terrified, they, 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 they are terrified of the Jews, they think we're the next ones to be crucified, we're the next ones they're going to take out, we're the next ones they're going to kill, and so they're all in hiding. And while they're all yet in hiding, of course they'd already been told that Jesus had resurrected, they didn't believe it, they thought it was a fairy tale, but Jesus appears in the midst of them, and of course shows them his hands and his side, 
and they realize this is the Christ, this is Jesus. And again, we oftentimes call Thomas the doubting one. But if you read the scripture properly, they all doubted. They all doubted. When the women came to tell them that the Lord had resurrected, they all doubted, every one of them. And every one of them had to see the marks in his hands, and every one of them had to see the wound in his side in order to believe. So it wasn't just Thomas that was doubting. All of them had doubted. I want to show you something very interesting about Thomas that you may have never seen before. Something that may have never crossed your mind, and maybe it has, and maybe I'm the only one that hasn't realized it. But when Thomas came in, they told him, the Lord has risen. And he said, I will not believe it unless I touch, his, unless I touch the, the nails in his hand. And I will not believe it unless I thrust my hand into his side. Jesus doesn't appear to Thomas right away. Do you know that Thomas waited eight days? The Bible said eight days later, Jesus appears and says, Thomas, touch my hands. Thomas, thrust your hand at my side. Which means that even though Thomas was doubting, he was waiting. He was patiently waiting for the confirmation of his faith. And after eight days, he stayed with them for eight days. Jesus appears unto him and, of course, graciously allows him to experience the validation of his faith. Children of God, that spoke so powerfully to me. Because if we'll just wait, sometimes we get in such a hurry for God to confirm his word, for God to affirm his word, and we want it right now. We are in the microwave generation. We are in the microwave age, and we want God to do it right now. We want the Lord to, to perform his word to us right now. We want God to confirm our faith right now. But if we'll just do what, oh, doubting Thomas, can you believe that? Maybe we have mislabeled Thomas. Thomas. If we'll just do what Thomas did and just wait, just wait, just stay faithful, stay gathering with the saints, stay committed, just stay there. If you'll just wait, it will not be but a matter of time and the Lord will come and affirm and confirm his word to you and to me. What an incredible thought that was to me. Just wait. Uh, just be patient. The Bible said we will reap uh, in due season if we faint not. If we don't give up, if we don't run away because everything isn't happening the way we think it should right now, if we'll just hold on. He held on. Old Thomas held on for eight days. He stayed there. And the Lord confirmed his faith. What an incredible thing. So maybe Thomas wasn't doubting as much as we think he was. The disciples got their confirmation right away. The rest of them. But Thomas stayed and wait, waited eight days for the Lord to confirm his faith. Maybe he had more faith than we think he did. Maybe he had more persistence and more, uh, more commitment than we think he did. So children of God... The Lord is going to perform His good word concerning you. He's going to do exactly what He said. He's not a man that He should lie, nor the Son of Man He should repent. He's going to pour out His Spirit upon our sons and our daughters. Our old men are going to dream dreams. Our young men are going to see visions. The responsibility of the church right now is just, just to be patient, to just wait, hold on. The Word of God is going to be performed. The signs of the times, they have been appearing for some time now. We're getting closer to the coming of the Lord. But before the coming of the Lord, it's going to rain again. And the Spirit of God is going to pour out upon all flesh. And we are going to see one more great move of God before this is all over with. So don't lose hope. Don't become impatient. In patience, possess ye your souls. Patiently wait, children of God. The Lord is not a man that he should lie. He's going to confirm. He's going to affirm. He's going to show you that what he says, he means. And what he means, he says. I just wanted to take a moment and share that incredible word with you. I thought, Lord, I've got Thomas all wrong. The man waited eight days before he saw the confirmation of his faith. But he did not leave. He didn't walk away like the, like the two to Emmaus. He waited and the Lord showed up. If you'll just wait, the Lord's going to show up for you. 
and he's going to perform his good word on your behalf. Don't you feel that? Don't you feel that in your spirit? I'm telling you, that was such an incredible thing for me. Just hold on, children of God. The best is yet to come. The church has not seen its greatest days yet. We're getting ready to walk into a move of God. Let's just impatience, impatience. Let's possess our souls. Let us, children of God, wait upon the Lord and be of good courage. The Lord told Joshua, he said, only be thou strong and very courageous. Hold on, children of God. We're going to see one more move of God. Just wait. Thomas, wait. The Lord's going to come in and he's going to show himself to you. All right? God bless you. Have a great rest of the, of, of the day celebrating the great resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. May God bless you and be with you in Jesus' name.